Hi everyone, David here. This is the 2020 JanFeb topic analysis for critical affirmatives and negatives. What we'll do is start by analyzing some critical affirmatives and then we'll transition into negatives talking about how to execute along the way. The first affirmative I want to talk about is the security affirmative. The thesis of this AF is that global powers securitize against threats in order to dominate the globe. The most important thing to note that produces uniqueness for this affirmative is that threats are not objective or static, but are rather subjective and relational. This is to say that what might be a threat to one actor isn't always necessarily a threat to another. The problem with this as a framework for international politics is that the most dominant actors then use this to justify problematic global politics. Rapid pro proliferation of nuclear weapons is both an effect and further perpetuation of this damaging framework. While most security arguments are tethered to the way a state acts on a day-to-day -day basis, the nuclear security regime is much more. Nuclear weapons as a tool of security are different from everyday ground forces and military bases for two reasons that are advantageous to this affirmative. First and foremost, nuclear weapons carry the risk to produce much more damage in a single level event than ground forces. But second, nuclear weapons represent security by reservation. It's the idea of being able to defend through, uh, through potential attack that makes this nuclear security state so dangerous. Because while the narrative of things like mutually assured destruction may be about why nuclear weapons are a deterrent to conflict, when you add their offensive capabilities to the idea of a threat that has been manufactured, the only logical conclusion is that global conflict becomes inevitable. For those that are more familiar with this argument from the policy side of things, this is the theoretical explanation for why miscalculation is a mathematical certainty. Affirmatives can and should claim that while removing nuclear weapons is able to resolve the immediate threat they pose to the world, it more importantly shifts the way that we think about global politics away from the belief that protecting any one regime is the most important thing in the world. An affirmative with a compelling story about why and how eliminating nuclear arsenals would influence either our political framework or our political rhetoric can claim advantages past just resisting death. This affirmative, while a solid position, comes with one internal contradiction to resolve. First, as we'll talk about when we get to the negative positions, there's a pretty compelling argument that, that the heart of security is about the rhetoric that we use to portray the potential of death. But this affirmative, in order to justify why securitization is bad, also needs to subscribe to the same images, i.e. the potential for nuclear weapons to cause mass destruction. Any potential security rhetoric will need a defense, and this affirmative needs to talk about why the method should be what we evaluate. I don't think this affirmative needs to win that every single use of security is bad, but just that the way nuclear regimes weaponize security is bad. This contradiction is easy to avoid as long as the affirmative stays as close to its original thesis over the course of the debate. For most critical affirmatives and some policy affirmatives, the security thesis will be applicable because it's at the heart of the topic. Other affirmatives might layer this with discussions of identity, philosophy, etc., but nearly every act will say that the way that we construct certain threats is bad and securitizes against a group of people, whether that be a race, a gender, or an international power. So it's important to understand how security operates on a representational and a methodological level. Next up is the FEMIRF. This affirmative argues that the global order is dominated by masculinity, which is only made possible and intelligible through consistently using aggressive behavior. This isn't just about the propensity for actions to escalate to war. Oftentimes, when we think about acts of aggression in geopolitics, our only consideration is active conflict. However, even passive actions such as proliferation are meant to send a signal to the rest of the world about dominance. It's the reason why leaders like Trump are hell-bent on galvanizing military equipment, forces, etc. at the expense of innocent civilians, often their own citizens. So this affirmative first connection to the topic is they're all processes linked to nuclear arsenals from building to maintenance are each meant to send a signal of masculine dominance to the rest of the world. However, the relationship between nuclear arsenals and masculinity is about more than just the process of building a nuclear arsenal. Symbolically, nuclear weapons are meant to represent masculinity. 
There's an alarming amount of evidence that analyzes everything from the shape, scale, and size of nuclear weapons and how those things are meant to prop up masculinity through fear. This symbolic value is meant to make masculinity both an object of fear and desire, which then makes femininity as its natural opposite an object of disgust and subservience. But inevitably, these symbols and signals will be interpreted by external powers not as a reason to back down, but as a challenge of dominance that makes war inevitable. The plan would hijack the symbolic networks that makes people act on signals of aggression and replace those signals of aggression with peace, which would influence the way the global liberal order acts. This would claim both the plan and the scholarship of the 1AC as being a necessary form of feminist intervention that deals with the inevitable threat of global destruction that comes from masculine tendencies. Let's move from femme to queer theory. This seems like the most probable affirmative for individuals that don't necessarily want to talk about the topic as a directive on action, but want to reinterpret the topic to talk about social location. This affirmative would claim that the big global conflict looming over the world isn't macro level instability, but rather the way the world antagonizes queer life on a micro political scale. So, as reinterpretation of the topic goes, this seems like one of the fairer ones in recent memory. Since the topic is about states eliminating nuclear arsenals, asking the question of what nuclear material the state weaponizes is potentially a reasonably topical discussion. The thesis of this affirmative would be that states weaponize the idea of the nuclear family against queer bodies. Queer bodies, particularly trans ones, are seen as devoid of value because value becomes tied to cis-normative tropes of reproduction or heterosexuality. This marks queer bodies for erasure by a few processes, such as imprisonment, societal humanizing, murder, and more. Not at all ironically, the two leading powers uh, with nuclear weapons, the United States and Russia, are two of the most homophobic states in the world, often exporting homophobic agendas to other countries in order to create a global network that demonizes queer life. Unlike the rest of the affirmatives discussed here, it'll be pretty hard to win a reverse causal claim that says the epistemic resistance of the affirmative will be able to change the normative framework that governs global politics. Therefore, it would be advantageous for an affirmative like this to potentially impact turn that demand and instead focus on why their epistemic resistance creates the conditions to embrace queer life. In other words, if you can't resolve like the primary internal link that makes homophobia exist, the only thing you can do is produce scholarship that negates, resists, or rejects the homophobia that's inevitable and is probably going to come. Last up is the settler colonialism affirmative. And this affirmative is two-pronged in the way that it relates to nuclear weapons. First, it claims that the weapons themselves are problematic because of the damage that they cause to native land and communities. More importantly, it also claims the reason why nuclear arsenals are so problematic is because they prop up a mindset that gives settlers the ability to control the land itself. Weaponization of material like uranium is built on a principle of eco-managerialism, where people exercise domination over the land, which then directly feeds into dominating other populations. Nuclear arsenals are actually a really perfect demonstration of the root cause claim that set call teams have been making for years, which is that mastery over the land bolsters both the will and the ability to exercise mastery over marginalized populations. This first requires you to win that nuclear arsenals actually do hurt the land. And there are plenty of examples of that because nearly every part of the process necessary for the creation and maintenance of nuclear arsenals hurts the land. Mining for fissile material destroys land and the waste produces even worse. At one point in period in American history, we were literally just dumping nuclear waste into the ocean because we had nowhere else to put it. And we looked for what was least valuable and most abundant to get the waste out of sight and out of mind, which was the ocean. This willingness to disrespect the land is at the heart of globalized systems of violence. For example, other nuclear powers have modeled this disposal method in their histories as well. The most analytical minds will take you up on the question of nuclear arsenals and their contributions to cellular colonialism. This probably manifests in a big alt-cause debate that triggers presumption against the affirmative. For example, uniqueness for the last topic about fossil fuels probably functions as an alt-cause and a reason why the affirmative could not eliminate set call because other things will just propagate it. However, this is just actually a pretty decent place for the affirmative to justify the educational value of its content. 
Like, it seems pretty weak to say that because there's an alt cause for oppression, it justifies not taking an action that could materially and symbolically wrestle with existing oppression. If this debate comes up, it's a perfect place for this affirmative to talk about why the 1AC is a rejection of impulses to continue justifying settler colonialism. That pedagogical model, which is linked to the plan, is a good form of study and a way to advance critical scholarship that maintains native sovereignty because it indicates the root of American governance should be land focus. Now, let's transition to some cool negative arguments that you can read um, that are based in critical scholarship. First up, Afro-pessimism. The thesis of this critique is that black death underpins everything, including obviously the 1AC politic, and that attempting to find value in a world maintained and structured by black death is bad. The real question people will ask is why does an attempt to get rid of nuclear weapons mean that someone is invested in anti-blackness, especially when the legacy of nuclear arsenals has been detrimental to black communities? This is the common argument that people make against Afro-pessimism, that the affirmative can be good for black people, and that in this instance, it's justified that, uh, because, you know, people will be able to say that pessimism doesn't mean that we shouldn't act. People will say that the affirmative is good in its relationship to blackness, but let pessimism teams are always going to find a solid link. The affirmative's drive to eliminate nuclear weapons is built on a desire to redeem the world. It assumes that the association that they are contingently good for a positive action for black people will somehow change the conditions that afflict them. This forecloses a structural analysis of anti-blackness and absolves the world of its continued perpetuation of anti-black tendencies. Moreover, people will say that preserving a future for black people is a better world than the one we live in right now. However, the elimination of nuclear weapons is not about returning to a good future, but it's rather about a really romanticized past. Nuclear zero is not about a pristine, like, it's, it's literally about a past that we care about, or a past where we thought the threat of nuclear weapons didn't exist. But this fascination with a fictive past is the lifeblood of anti-blackness. It's the reason why slogans like Trump's Make America Great Again make sense. There is no past, nuclear weapons or not, where black people are not connected to death. This means that the affirmative's idea of moving away from death is only important because, because it bears the potential of saving white life. Unlike a lot of other topics where there are some decent Afro-pessimism links to the action of the plan, most people tend to agree that nuclear weapons are pretty bad for black people. While this doesn't matter much for most pessimism teams, it does produce the potential for some pretty sick link turns, which means the topic's best Afropest links will be against the internal links and impact scenarios of affirmatives. Generating offense against things like extinction, global movements, and multilateralism will be a lot less risky to lose the link turn than trying to say that like Russia having nuclear weapons is good. An important thing to note for pessimism on this topic is that you should think about anti-blackness as a precondition to chaos, not a consequence. This tip should direct the way that you leverage the critique against the permutation. The affirmative's analysis will likely view individual instances of anti-blackness, such as proliferation, as a consequence of a global order fortified by nuclear power, instead of anti-blackness as the fuel that produced that global order. This means that their analysis will always fall short and will excuse anti-blackness under the hopes that structural adjustments will come close to making up for black debt. Next up is CAP. This critique would argue that while denuclearization appears to be about creating a general good for society, the hidden goal is about expanding international influence. There are two warrants for this. First, the looming threat of nuclear weapons creates the possibility of crisis, which results in imbalance that's bad for capitalist powers. Second, the fact that certain powers have access to nuclear weapons and others do not decks global legitimacy and makes them seem like aggressors. This makes non-nuclear states hesitant about unwillingly or unwittingly part participating in economic endeavors, which stifles globalization. This means that nuclear movements are the new frontier for globalization. Multilateral action against nuclear weapons would help restore international legitimacy and create confidence in capitalist powers. On a symbolic level, this is bad because it attempts to profit off of the fear of weapons that global power has created. You should think about denuclearization as selling off nuclear weapons in exchange for goodwill. Investing in a politics that profits off of fear is parasitic and justifies horrible policymaking such as over-policing. 
This implication requires winning that discourse affects the direction of policy. But on a material level, this reinvestment in capitalism is bad because it leads to global destruction. There's a plethora of authors that say that capitalism as a system is unsustainable and leads to debt through things like war, climate change, etc. Unlike domestic topics, the CAPK on this topic gives you the ability to explore international anti-capitalist movements that are pretty successful in making strides against capital now. But the will to engage those movements only exists because global capitalist powers like the United States lack international legitimacy, which the plan would probably restore. This is a unique reason why the critique responds to the plan and the permutation fails. Much like with Afro-pessimism, the glaring weakness of this critique against traditional affirmatives will be that the permutation seems convincing, especially because nuclear states can use hard power to expand capitalism and countries on the lower end of capitalism still probably agree with the plan. That being said, winning against the permutation can still be done in a few ways. First, you can make the entire debate about epistemology and double down on the discourse effects policy arguments. Second, even if those countries' governments agree with the plan, it still adversely affects the anti-cap movements, which means that the alternative is preferable. And third, defense against the plan bolsters the try or die claim for the alternative, which means that you can always go for like try or die, the apps doesn't do anything. Now the security K on the negative side. So I mentioned when talking about the security affirmative, one of the problems it has is that in order to justify why nuclear weapons are so bad, people will have to use security rhetoric. If an affirmative is a topical action that defends the consequences of states eliminating their nuclear arsenals, their inherency and advantage cards should be places where you can pull out direct lines that link to the security kit. This means that denuclearization is not an immediate necessity, but it's rather just feeding into, the th into threat construction in order to justify a liberal international politic. This creates a pretty solid case turn to affirmatives for a few reasons. First, it justifies the worst forms of intervention because people are always on edge about who has the most power and might be willing to use it. Second, because the basis for denuclearization was based on the fear of potential enemies, we begin to look at the world through the lens of combatancy, which increases the propensity for war. Third, the countries that are most prevalent in the denuclearization fight will attempt to bully smaller powers and scale down their nuclear arsenals even more. This is historically proven by how countries like South Africa were coerced into giving up their nuclear weapons and joining multilateral non-proliferation treaties. Now, the fourth one is interesting because it proves that the affirmative can never solve. There is substantial evidence that says that once we lose nuclear weapons, the probability of conventional war skyrockets. Now, most policy teams will probably concede this because conventional war is non-unique and nuclear war outweighs. However, this sets the security K up well to make two claims. First, the linear nature of conventional war means that it can always get worse. And second, conventional war never lasts that long because it's always the impetus for new military tech developments. There are multiple historical warrants for this, but the one that's most applicable for this topic is the development of nuclear weapons was a response to conventional war. This means that either conventional war might create a weapon worse than nuclear weapons, which I can't even imagine, or more likely that in a conventional conflict, the regime that the 1AC forces to eliminate their nuclear arsenals just end up renuclearizing. The, uh, the, and the offensive implication is that now not only do they have a new rebooted nuclear arsenal, but they also have a reason to use them, which is functionally worse than the status quo. This means that the security K uh, independently turns the affirmative. This is an example of how even though the critique starts as one of reps, it still ends up affecting the method. Without this, it makes the critique a one-trick pony and makes it more likely that a good 1AC and like a good like 1AR framework justification will move most of the 1NC offense. The last thing we're going to talk about is the Orientalism affirmative or rather the Orientalism critique. Orientalism is a theory developed by Edward Said, who said that the way that the Western world interacts with like non-Western powers and generates influence isn't based on material subjugation, but based on controlling the images and representations of people in the Orient. Sometimes this is done through aestheticizing them or fetishization, but in the case of nuclear regimes, the narrative told about non-Western powers is that they're irrational and dangerous. These images drive the non-proliferation movements 
and link arguments should attempt to find out where these images are in affirmatives. So for example, an affirmative that talks about instability in the Middle East or the rhetoric of rogue states or Middle Eastern terrorists stealing nuclear material would all constitute affirmatives that this critique would indict. But rhetoric like this produces a self-fulfilling prophecy and is cyclical. Weaponizing such polarizing rhetoric against an entire region is more likely to do things like destabilize these regions. Think about how terror occurs and like organizations merely display American Orientalism as a propaganda tool. But it's about more than just that. That rhetoric influences people in everyday society. And then those people justify policy based on that rhetoric. And this produces the cultural fabric of America and justifies things like attacking Middle Eastern people because of a racist narrative against them that's re-entrenched by the affirmative. But U.S. policy on the Middle East might be the place where this critique can generate the most unique offense. Most of our operations in the Middle East are based on one of two things. Either they're based on the conflict that we have perpetuated by our involvement in the region, or it's based on narratives that have no real basis. This is the reason why people believe that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, which allowed us to invade when in reality that invasion was responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of Iraqi people, particularly women and children. For more contemporary examples, you should ask yourself why the United States is unable to leave Afghanistan, even when the top foreign policy leaders cannot explain a single reason for why we need to be there. These Orientalist images of the Middle East as inherently dangerous are the only reason we continue to manufacture conflicts, but the affirmative rhetoric would make that a certainty. Okay, I hope this functions as a start for critical research and helps direct the way that you think about critiques on this topic. There's actually potential for really deep and well-developed critical debates on this topic from all angles. So good luck, and I hope you have a lot of fun reading critiques and or critical affirmatives on this topic.